Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have Philip Schuster from Slack visiting us today uh, to talk about uh, continuous spin particles and so interesting, very, very interesting things about it. I'll take it over, Philip. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here talking to all of you today. So I'm gonna tell you about the physics of massless continuous, continuous spin particles. Really my goal in this talk is not to explain everything in, in detail. I wanna just strip away some of the sort of mystique surrounding this subject. Um, it actually is a lot more familiar than you might think. And I hope that'll be the takeaway when I'm done. So all of this is based on work with Natalia Toro, as well as recently with, two, with three students, uh, Kevin Zhu, Gauri Sundarisan and Shire Neil Kandu. Okay, at a high level, the tidbits of physics that I want to explain in this talk are that in general, in a Lorentz invariant theory, helicity polarizations can mix under boosts. Normally we assume that doesn't happen, but that does not follow from Lorentz invariance alone. That mixing is controlled by a spin scale. This has been known for a very long time. So I'll review that. And where we're at now is shedding light on the question of whether fundamental particles with this property can interact at all, okay? So to do that, I'm gonna break this talk into three parts. I'm gonna to try to give you the top line kind of what, why, and how of CSPs in the first 15, 20 minutes. And then after that, you will sort of get the punchline of my talk after that. Then we'll take a slightly deeper dive, but still I'll just give you a, largely a flavor for the formalism we use for studying interactions and actually computing physical observables. And then I'll give you some examples. And we're just scratching the surface at this point. So I'll give you examples that are connected to QED and then at leading order to, to gravity. Now, I think uh, given the time, I may not have be able to really dive into some of the speculations surrounding uh, CSPs in the standard model, but we'll see. And I'm happy to talk offline. So let's start with massless particles. So when we talk about particles, we mean some set of states labeled by, I'll work in four dimensions, but there's a similar story in any number of dimensions. There's some uh, four momentum P. There are some number of internal charges that are entirely fixed when the state undergoes Lorentz transformations. And then the other degrees of freedom that can in principle transform under Lorentz transformations, we refer to those as the spin degrees of freedom. Now, mathematically, these degrees of freedom, they necessarily transform in a representation of what's known as the little group of the Lorentz, of the Poincaré group. And the way to think about that is that's the set, that's the subgroup of Lorentz transformations that leave P invariant. So just to give you some intuition for this, we can think about it in the case of a massive particle. Covariantly, the little group is described by the components of the poly lebansky vector, which is the epsilon contraction of the momentum with the Lorentz boosts, the components of that vector leave P invariant, like they generate transformations that leave P invariant. So for a massive case, if you go to the rest frame, the components are just proportional to mass times the uh, rotation generator. So you see that the group is SO3, the relativistic invariant that corresponds to the representations of that group are just the square of the poly Lebansky vector. And given the structure of SO3, that's discretized. And so that eigenvalue, that quantum number, is just proportional to mass squared and then S times S plus one. Now, the massless case is different. It is the case that the components of the poly Lebansky vector can continue to generate the little group. So you can do your covariant analysis the exact same way. But now what happens is there's no rest frame. So two of the components, they become degenerate and they're just proportional to what we're used to calling the helicity operator. This is just the angular momentum, if you will, in the direction of, of the spatial momentum. It's not a covariant quantity, but it's a convenient one to use. Now, what we, what we often do is we describe states, we like to pretend like we can uniquely describe or sort of completely describe states by their eigenvalue under this helicity operator. But the problem is, is there's a, there are two more operations that we can do that leave a momentum invariant in the null case. There are combinations of boosts and rotations. So in particular, if my momentum is oriented this direction, I can boost in this direction and then rotate back to get back to the same momentum. So it's two linear combinations of rotations and boosts. Those operations commute with each other and together they have a group structure, which is ISO2 or the group of motions of the plane in two dimension. So there's two translations. That's, that's the operations I just referred to. And then there's rotations. 
which is which is generated by the helicity operator. The invariant continues to be the square of the polylobansky vector, and it's independent of helicity. Nonetheless, it is convenient to describe these states in a basis of eigenstates of the helicity operator. So we'll do that. So we'll just that we can, we're free to diagonalize the helicity operator. The eigenvalues are either integer or half integer in general. That continues to be the case. So discrete helicity. But let's look at how uh, these other translations of the little group operate on these states. Analogous to what you would do in SO3 to build the representations, it's convenient to group these into operators that have a raising and lowering operator structure with commutation relations with the list of the operator given by this. And then what you find is that these little group translation operators change the helicity of the state by one unit. And the, and the, uh, the this constant of proportionality rho is independent of helicity. It corresponds to the square of the polylobansky vector. So it's, it's the Casimir of this representation. It's a quantum number, has units of momentum. And this is what is referred to as the spin scale. Now, when this thing is non-zero, the irreducible representation, the thing that you could, you could reach just by undergoing successive boosts from any one of these states, necessarily includes an entire tower of either of integer space helicities. They're either integers or they're, either, or they're half integers. Later, I mean, in the field theory, we can justify this as there's a bosonic CSP and there's a fermionic CSP. But that's what, that is what a continuous spin particle is. It's a tower of internal polarizations that the massless state can, in principle, carry. Sorry, and the fact that it's an infinite tower just follows from this little group structure. Right. Is, is the role continuous? Just so, yeah, yeah, next slide. So, I'm gonna, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the bosonic case. Right? W is the spin scale. This is referred to as a continuous spin particle. Continuous refers to the fact that rho can take on any continuous number. Sometimes these are referred to as infinite spin particles. That refers to the fact that the, there's a tower of polarization states that is infinite in extent. Okay. Um, there's a special exception that occurs when rho equals zero, which is that each of these just transforms as singlets. They no longer mix under boosts. That's the case that we see in familiar theories. But in general, if rho isn't zero, that need not be the case. You're guaranteed by symmetry to then just have partners. Now, I just I want to pause and just say that if you if you look back at the literature on this, there's a tremendous amount of confusion that has unfortunately stemmed from this term continuous spin. It's really thrown people off over the, I mean, just for silly reasons. So the, this representation is unitary? Yeah. It is the generic unitary repre representation of a massless particle in a Lorentz invariant theory. I gave you the story in four dimensions. There's an analogous story in two plus one and or in any number of dimensions. These representations can be generalized to other maximally symmetric spaces. You can supersymmetrize them. They're very, very generic. Okay, now over the years, a number of things have been said about this possibility. So I'm gonna give you the kind of quick reasons to ignore the non-zero row possibility. And in fact, this was my on-ramp into the subject. So when I was a student, one of the most, you know, what kind of some of the most appealing sets of results over the last 50 years were these results from Weinberg and others looking at how massless particles of fixed helicity, so the rho equals zero case, could possibly interact and give rise to long range interactions that are non trivial. And this culminated essentially in the result that essentially, if you want anything non trivial, it's helicity two or less that works, and you run into problems starting at helicity three and higher, at least for the bosonic case. And there are exceptions, and they're interesting exceptions, but that's largely the result of, of these uh, Weinberg soft theorems and the Weinberg width theorem. I came in along with Natalia with the goal of generalizing these results to just show that the row of not equal to zero case was just forbidden. So instead, what you find is that um, the conceptual approach that these, that these results rely on breaks down at step one. They all deeply rely on the boost invariance of the helicity quantum number. We can, I'm happy to come back to this offline, but uh, ultimately uh, you can't kill these theories on the basis of those arguments for that reason. The analogy to have in mind is a little bit closer to like, you know, how you can have an interacting massive high spin particle. I mean, in, in nature, those are composite objects, but at the level of like 
group, group transformation laws and unitarity and Lorentz invariance constraints, it works a little bit more analogously to that. Okay, the other thing that has been said over the years is that if, if you have a particle with an infinite number of internal polarization states, how on earth are interactions going to make any sense? You, know, you should worry about divergent cross sections. Can you ever have a thermodynamic limit? So that was actually something that Wigner worried about. Um, but nobody actually worked out if and how these things could interact. And part of the reason is that nobody knew how to write down even a free field theory um, until about 10 years ago. So there were just a lot of difficult stumbling blocks uh, you know, prior to about a decade ago. And so what you'll see is there's actually a pretty interesting resolution to this, to this question in particular. Okay, so where we're at now is instead of you know, speculating about how these things work out, uh, we have a framework where you can just calculate and generalize certain simple theories to the case of non-zero row. And instead of guessing how things work, um, we can just see. I mean, there's an intentionless limit of a string. Which would people have the... sometimes referred to, so people have tried to get at these from the tensionless limit of the boson X string. But you don't, you There's no can, row parameter. Let's come, let's come back to that at the end, because I just want to say from the outset that if you just take the perturbative boson X strings, you don't get a CSP in the spectrum at any finite tension. And it's not clear what you get in the tensionless limit. And I, I actually think the story with string constructions is much more interesting than what's currently in the literature, and I'd be happy to talk about it um, after the talk. Okay, so I'm not going to explain these plots. Really, this is just uh, this is meant for the high-level takeaway. We can calculate, we can look at the answers, we can see how this works. The punchline is that in interacting, in simple interacting theories that have CSPs, it is always the case. It is always the case that in the limit of small rho, we will only ever recover a familiar gauge theory dominated by interacting velocity zero, one, and two polarization states with all other polarization modes decoupling. And there's a precise sense in which this happens. Okay, yes, sorry, so I'll no. walk you through results. Yeah, go ahead. When, when you say uh, interacting, do you mean to include gravity in there? So I will include, so the first toy example will be E and M without gravity. And then I'm going to literally talk about gravity at non-zero row, more precisely GR at non-zero row at leading order. Okay. So you would identify the graviton as? In that case, it would be the, yeah. And then there's a, there are separate questions about, you can sort of mix and mingle these things. You could ask like, well, can, you, can one state have non-zero row, but then you have a graviton that's got row equals zero. Do you run into problems that way? And I think there's the potential to. Maybe to ask it a little differently, suppose GR is the usual thing and the graviton is not a CSP. Suppose now you add something else that is a CSP. Do all of the helicity states play by the usual rules no. of GR? Okay. No, 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 no. You cannot have a spin diagonal coupling with a helicity two mode. So whether you call that equivalence principle violating or not actually is, is an interesting question. I can, I actually have a backup slide on this. Okay, great. But there's a spin dependent factor that appears if you try to do that. Okay, so just to conclude, before we go through the rest of this talk, if you, if you walk out of this room with kind of one sort of bit of intuition for how to think about these interacting CSP theories, and this is a little bit of embarrassment of mine that I'm gonna make this analogy with, with dark sectors. It is the case, and it just follows from symmetry, that an interacting CSP theory in this case, I'm showing an interaction of a particular type that you'll see later that, is, that singles out the helicity one modes. And what you always find is that for interactions at frequencies large compared to the spin scale, all of the nearest neighbor modes, so the partner modes that are the partner modes of the plus minus one state here, they get suppressed by powers of rho over omega. And then the further away you are, you get suppressed by more powers of rho over omega, where omega is the frequency of the radiation that you're considering in the scattering problem. And so you Sorry, always end up- The coupling you talk about only couples to specific helicities? No, no, no. What do you Everybody mean? Everybody had an so, single off. So, so I'll, I'll, try to, I'll, I'll say it again here. So if you consider a scattering process involving a CSP, and say a matter state, like an electron. What you will always get is an answer that you would have got by 
taking a standard, just a familiar standard model life sector. So in this, in this little picture, it would be literally QED. And then you add to it a tower of partner modes with a structure that is entirely dictated by Lorentz invariance. There's no like knobs to turn. All the couplings are determined by the spin scale, but they're parametrically, their strength is rho over the frequency. The characteristic, I mean, it'll be, it'll be a different frequency for different scattering problems, but basically in the high energy limit, you have a small coupling, which is spin scale over frequency. That's a small dimensionless effective coupling that appears. And it sequesters all of the partner modes except for the primary modes. Sorry, is that a pretty oh, sorry. And it's so this is this is the picture to have in mind in the limit of small row. And then that breaks down in the deep infrared. Okay. And I'll and I'll show you how that works. Okay. But this intuition actually works pretty well in the small row limit. Your you swap radiation is very, very significantly modified. Absolutely. So, 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 so the punchline of this talk is that CSPs look like familiar theories at frequencies large compared to the spin scale, and it's a radical departure in the deep infrared. Okay, and that, and, and the nature of that departure is, is largely fixed by symmetries. Okay, so that's the top line. So known massless particles do have a spin scale. It's just a question of whether it's zero or not. It's a simple and fundamental question. Uh, the non-zero option will turn out to make quite a bit more sense than we previously thought. I think we're just scratching the surface. There'll be a lot of directions to look at. I'll give you a flavor of where we're at. Um, but if this picture holds, it opens up a lot of interesting directions and questions. And I'm not, I mean, too many to enumerate. We can, we can come back to this. Okay, so let's get, let's make this quite a bit more concrete. So part two here is I'm going to introduce the formalism that we use for studying interactions in certain simple theories. Now, I want to give you a little bit of motivation for, for the formalism that we use, starting from the observation that, you know, a CSP at the level of modes has every helicity mode in it, okay? And we know that as, when rho goes to zero, they separate into singlets. Now, if you were to do this in field theory, there's a well-developed formalism um, that essentially tells us we should use a gauge theory of a rank H symmetric tensor to at least describe at the free level a helicity H mode. So we have a gauge theory formalism that's been developed over the years to do that. Now in the free case, the gauge redundancy is abelian. So the simple theories I'm gonna talk about, and it's for simplicity only, are going to be abelian theories in this talk, and then we can, we can, there's no particular reason it doesn't generalize. Now, from this point of view, if you're going to describe a CSP in field theory, given these observations, you, you want it to kind of decompose into similar modes in the row goes to zero limit, and this directly inspires the use of a CSP superfield, and that is somewhat analogous to what's done in supersymmetry. We're going to add we're going to think of the field, in this case, a scalar field, living not just on Minkowski space, but there's going to be this internal space as well that is parameterized by a four vector, a bosonic four vector eta. And the scalar field is analytic in this auxiliary variable. Okay, so it has some expansion as so. And these rank, these rank H tensors just appear as the coefficient functions in this expansion. Lorentz transformations act in the way that you would guess, right? Just X goes to lambda X, eta goes to lambda eta. Now, everything I'm gonna show you in the, in the following slides could have been derived without reference to this auxiliary superspace, bosonic superspace. You can do everything in tensors if you want, but this will prove to be enormously useful for concrete calculations. If you do embrace the superspace the super business, there is a very natural action that one can derive from the bottom up. I'm, that's not what this talk is about. I'm just gonna tell you this, this is the action. It's gonna look like an inspired guess. It has two terms. It has something that should look like a very familiar kinetic term. And then this term sort of is most analogous to like the divergence of like the vector potential square. That's kind of what it's analogous to. So eta is something you integrate over. Eta and X are integrated over. These delta functions are enforcing that the auxiliary space is confined to a hyperboloid, okay? And we can talk about why later. There are specific rules for doing the eta integrals that you don't need to know. Again, I'm happy to talk about it, but it's like, it's kind of a technicality. 
the, the thing I want you to know is that if you do, if you go back and you do this expansion of your analytics for superspace field, there's a particular way of grouping the terms that's most convenient to make this correspondence clear. But if you do this expansion and you plug it into that action and you look at the, the Lagrangian you get after you integrate over eta, you get this Lagrangian. You literally get a sum of massless scalar field, massless vector, four vector field, Fierce poly action, and then from rank three and higher, they're referred to as Frontdale actions. You get the entire tower in one go. Okay. Now, so if you want, you could forget this eta space business. You could say, I don't, I'm confused by this. It's whatever. Okay. And you could just work with this. So the spin two R is a. The spin only, only is linear. linear is in the Fierce poly. And, and at the free level, it's always linear. Yeah. And you're going to see, actually, there's an abelian theory with a spin two polarization state that interacts. And the reason that works is because it's, it's not boost invariant polarization two state, OK? It's much more analogous to like a massive spin two state. Let's, but anyway, we'll, let's just calculate. So what was the delta prime on the previous slide? Just the derivative of the delta function. OK. So this is to say, if you want to ignore eta space, you can. What we found and what really enabled progress, where I think it would have been hard otherwise, is that a lot of the sort of symmetries of the problem, concrete calculations, et cetera, are just vastly simpler in eta space. As weird as it may look, it's just vastly simpler, OK? Now, I want to give you an analogy um, with uh, ENM. So uh, this might be a little confusing because I had like a vector potential that appeared in the previous slide. This left column here is just meant to remind you in your mind of how things work in QED, okay? So if you take that action in eta space, you take the action, there's an equation of motion that has a, a, a large gauge redundancy. And it, for this action, it is an abelian gauge redundancy that allows you to fix in a covariant way a convenient gauge choice. So analogous to the divergence list condition, there's a sort of similar gauge fixing condition. I'm happy to unpackage this if you want. The important point is that in this covariant gauge, the equations of motion become that of a massless state. And if you go through the analysis of working out what the physically distinct basis of states are, you find explicitly like wave functions that carry all integer polarizations H from minus infinity to infinity. So that's the sort of basis of solutions to that equation of motion given that gauge redundancy. So the classical theory certainly describes a CSP and you can go through the exercise of quantizing it usual equal time commutation relations, causality conditions satisfied. You can derive that the energy helicity CSPs are indeed bosonic. You can derive that the, that the half integer ones are indeed fermionic and so forth. All of that just goes through in a textbook fashion. Where this takes us to though, is a good firm starting point for understanding how to couple to matter. And again, for simplicity, we're gonna focus on the abelian theories. And then, you know, just like you would in a sort of textbook treatment of the subject, you can back up and then consider non-abelian generalizations of the gauge redundancy if you want. Now, in ENM, the way to do that is you just couple to a, a current that, provided it's conserved, satisfies the gauge redundancy, and then off you go. Here, we couple the scalar superspace field to a scalar current. Gauge, the gauge redundancy requires a conservation condition that's totally analogous to what you see, see in familiar theories. And provided that's satisfied, off you go with a consistent set of equations of motion and a nice invertible propagator and so forth. So once you've found a set of suitable currents, you can use the familiar machinery that we're all used to to calculate whatever you want, either in the classical theory, or if you want, you can construct scattering amplitudes. And I just, I, I'll just remind you how that works in a second. But, but sorry, J is made off of by the fields with a same role or different role? No, so J of eta X is a current that's going to live in this super yeah, space. Right, but they will, will be and it's going to be built out of, out of matter. And I'm going to, I'll tell you in the next slide what it's, what, it's, what it's built out of. So for technical reasons, we have found, so, okay. When we first started working on this, we were trying to build currents out of fields directly. And there's some technical reasons why this is tricky to do in this super space. Now, ask me in like a month or two, and I think we, we, may, have, we, have, we may have actually figured it out, but backing up two years ago, 
For technical reasons, it was a lot simpler to model the matter using the world line formalism, okay? So simplest case would be a scalar particle described by a world line rather than a field, okay. right? Now, like, this works. I mean, you can, you can formulate uh, ENM and QED this way if you want. So in that case, the vector current just becomes the integral over the world line parameter tau of z dot of mu. That current is conserved so long as the world lines only begin and end at charge conserving vertices. So you do have to put that in by hand. But once you've got that, you can go off and calculate whatever you want in the classical theory. It's, it's fine. Moreover, the path integral lets you formulate QED this way. You do have to put in antiparticles by hand, right? That's something that we normally can derive in field theory and the world line formalism. It is an input for consistency. Having done that though, the path integral gives you a good perturbative definition of the scattering amplitudes in QED. And in fact, this is the way QED was done in the 1940s through the early 50s, okay? Before field theory took over is the way we... Just to make sure, these, these particles all have the same role or the same... No, 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 this is just a normal scalar matter particle. And I'm gonna, that I'm just reminding you that you can, you, can, you can consider a normal scalar matter particle and couple it to fields without describing it as a field. I'm just trying to motivate that okay. here. Okay, so what we're going to do is, an, is a similar analysis to what you could do, say, just in ENM, trying to build QED. So we want to couple a particle's world line to a CSP field. So this answers your, your question, Liam Tao. So the matter is going to be a scalar particle, the, the and it's normal, going to be described by particle. a normal particle, rho equals zero. It's, okay. it's got a mass in this case, okay? Although we could make it massless. Mm -hmm. And we're going to couple it to a CS field, CSP field. So to do that, you need to find a current built out of world line data that satisfies the continuity condition. So there's one assumption that we want to build into this that turns out to be important for reasons of causality and also just simplicity, which is world line locality, world line locality. So under that assumption, so, so, so we're assuming it's just built out of an integral d tau of a function of z of tau and z dot of tau, and only that, no explicit tau dependence or higher order in, uh, in, in uh, derivatives of z. So moving over into Fourier space, so here's how we write the current. So some function that includes eta, it's gonna be analytic in eta. The Fourier coefficient has to satisfy this equation for this current to satisfy the continuity condition. So this is like a very bottom up, let's just see what on earth is required by symmetry to make this work, okay? And again, you could do this for, for uh, E and M and you would arrive at the sort of standard results that way. So we, we, we found the most general solution to this continuity condition under the assumption of world line locality and it has a strikingly simple structure. So all of the, all of the, so there's a term that is proportional to the free equation of motion what that means is that if you're considering the production of like massless modes or the far field effects and problems, this will never contribute. And then all of the rho and eta dependence is given by a phase times one function of k dot z dot. Okay, so if you're, if you're interested in on-shell radiation or far field radiation in the classical theory or on-shell scattering in the quantum theory, the general solution is actually fully determined by one simple function of k dot z dot, which you can tailor expand and just and literally just look at what theories you get at each at each order in your tailor expansion. Okay, so this this piece of the solution is fully fixed. This is a general function. It needs to be it should be suitably analytic in k dot z dot. Simplest possibility is a constant, which will just give a, give a coupling constant g. Next possibility would be linear in Z dot, and then we can go to higher and higher powers. Now I will say, as you go to higher and higher powers of Z dot, you obtain theories that are badly behaved in the UV. So starting at, at rank two, you start to obtain theories that are not well behaved in the UV. Totally analogous to what happens in GR, by the way, okay? The, uh, so I'm gonna call the constant term a scalar light current for reasons that'll be apparent later, the second term a vector light current, and these I'll refer to as tensor light or non minimal these two will turn out to be well-behaved in the UV. Okay, so let's go and calculate. So I wanna start from the vector current because it makes contact with, the, with, the, with an interesting 
toy theory that we all know and love. So the vector interaction was this class that's linear in Z dot. If you take this current and you go off and you calculate whatever you want, the simplest problem probably being just the, the radiation from a moving particle in the classical limit. Um, done here for simplicity is just an oscillating particle at frequency, oscillating at frequency omega with velocity V naught. And you can take the field theory, you can compute the stress energy tensor, and you can look at the energy flowing off to the boundary in the far field limit to get the power. And what you obtain is the standard Larmor power and then very specific predicted row dependent corrections to that power. So this is an expansion given in the limit of small rho over the frequency of the radiation being emitted. This is the frequency of the oscillation. Shown over here on the right is a plot of the power normalized in units of the Larmor power versus rho velocity over omega. So the so large frequency is over here on the left of the plot. That's the UV. Low frequency is over here on the right part of the plot. That's the infrared. So you can also break down the amount of power emitted into the individual modes. What you find is that in the UV, you obtain the standard result that you obtain in EMM, and it's all dominated by the helicity plus minus one modes. As you move into the infrared, the other modes start to become important. You start to produce the nearest neighbor modes first, the helicity zero and plus minus two. And it becomes increasingly democratic as you move into the infrared with more and more modes playing, playing a role. And in the case of the dynamic finite row, the power actually asymptotes to one half, like exactly one half of the result you get in the, in the case of row equals zero in the deep infrared. But it's always finite and well behaved. And actually, this is, they're just Bessel functions that control this behavior. Now, why is this happening? Why? Like, this looks like a miracle. If you go back to the current and you stare at it for a little bit, you don't have to stare very long. And you just do a Taylor expansion. So let's, let's look at this first term. Now, I put a one over rho here, but that's a little bit of a fake because, because whatever scale appeared here, you could, have, you could have just called it rho and reabsorbed the difference into your dimensionless coupling, so fine. But the first term in the Taylor expansion of the current is actually a total world line tau derivative, okay? It's a total derivative. It will never contribute, provided charge is conserved. Okay, so if, there, if the theory of base charge conservation, this is a total derivative. The, eta, the rho independent part is the eta space form of the usual vector current that appears in ENM. And then everything else is suppressed by powers of rho. So if you, if you make this observation early on, you just know that anything you compute is going to be ENM plus corrections. The fact that things are well behaved in the deep infrared follows in all cases from the fact from this particular phase structure that's bounded in the deep infrared. Okay, and that's entirely dictated by the continuity condition, which in turn is actually just following from enforcing Lorentz invariance. Just a big picture question for a moment. Yeah. So if we go back, this was an example of what happens if you take the vector-like interaction, then you just couple it to some classical matter, right? Um, but if I think of a CSP as being this tower of states, the fact that it's a bosonic one means that I would, I guess, have to intervene individually and say, I want this one to couple like a vector. I want this one to couple predominantly like a tensor. Like, what's the selection principle at the level of the Lorentz invariant uh, interaction that tells me? I that think that's a, yeah, so I think that's a good question. And at our level of analysis, and I, I want to say this is like, you know, there's bias built into this. But the, the picture there is that there's essentially one kind of massless state, and it's the type of interaction that determines what kind of effective theory you end up with in the UV. That's the picture. It's frankly a little bit analogous to the way that the sort of low energy theory emerges in string theory. You have like one string, but then depending on the details of the vacuum, you get a particular texture of interactions. Here, it's, it's the interactions that single out that behavior. So how about the, is our, our usual photon? Couples to this kind of field. Yeah, so this is a good, so, 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 so let's talk about the, 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 let me come back to that because you may have meant the row equals zero photon. Yeah, row equals zero photon couples to the row not the equal to zero uh, vector. Can, can, can I do that or? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done that analysis. It's just, that's, just, that's a good question. Um, so we can go ahead and do the, the, we can do scalar QED. So now we're talking about scattering amplitudes at non-zero row. 
It's scalar QED because it's scalar matter. Okay, and we can use the path integral that I alluded to before to actually just straight out compute these amplitudes. And that one of the simplest non-trivial amplitudes are the Compton-like amplitudes. You have two CSPs, two matter legs. You can literally have Compton, or if you want to do crossing, you can have pair production if you want. So what actually falls out, so just like in, uh, in normal field theory, what you typically compute are M functions that carry vector indices, and then you contract those into wave functions to get amplitudes. Here, what naturally comes out are, are these eta dependent M functions, and then you integrate those against wave functions to get amplitudes. Uh, you actually get fairly compact results. They have all of the appropriate physical single singularities, and on those singularities, you get appropriate factorization. All of the sort of finite angle differential cross sections are well behaved. And the only row dependence was actually appearing in this particular phase structure here. So, before we continue, did you explain the appearance of the factor one half? I, I, or I, I don't it. know why. It's uh -huh, a factor okay. one half. And I, we, we like deeply feel like there should be a good reason. And I just right, I don't know. So, Thanks for noticing that. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. I like, think that you're going to rise out for an explanation. Um, I have I have a lot more uh, I don't knows than I have answers unfortunately. <clears throat> so 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 the reason this is well behaved in infrared is because of the exponential. Yeah, so you would never see this if you expanded say perturbatively. You never see it if you try to do a perturbative expansion at small row. In I mean there's a there's a what's happening here. So technically there's an essential there's an isolated essential singularity that for real momentum in the physical like for physical momentum is far better behaved than any whole would ever be. And in fact, that's crucial. So actually in these amplitudes, the I epsilons that are required to enforce unitarity, they're down here, they are not up here, okay? That's important. It's like non commutative field theory in that respect. Well, if by that you mean it sort of looks like this isn't a point particle, like it's some kind of extended object. I would agree with that. I'm not sure that the amount, like that it's, that it's. Well, just a, just a, you, you get well-behaved. Um, oh, you mean the analytic well structure. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, perhaps, perhaps, yeah, perhaps. perhaps. Like you, again, you wouldn't see it if you expanded in the. Okay, well, that's what you mean, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. So this clearly has a smooth row goes to zero limit. The phase just drops out. And in that instance, only the H equals one mode survives in the amplitude that just follows from linearity of data. We can happy to go through this, but I'll show it to you in a plot. So here is a, here's actually just a integrated cross section for the non-zero row case normalized to the standard row equals zero QED. I think the out, this is in the, this is in the sort of, uh, this is uh, CSP photon matter goes to CSP photon matter. I think shown in this plot is some generic angle, like 30 degrees or something. And what you see here is that in the UV, just like you did with the radiation, like what you saw with the radiation problem, you obtain the standard result, and it's dominated by the blue line here, meaning the, only the helicity one modes. And as you move into the infrared, the partner modes play an increasingly important role, and notably, you see a screening effect. Now, there's, there's IR singularities in all of these QED amplitudes that we're familiar with. Um, those singularities are actually softer at non-zero row. They're still present. But it's, that, that has nothing to do with like the fact that you have inference singularities has nothing to do with, with, with the fact that it was a CSP. So, so for two to two amplitude, the, the analytic structure is different from the usual yeah. quantum field theory. Yeah. And it's a, you're trying to say it's, it's different in a good way. Yeah. Um, it looks just like. But what about in the in, in physical region, the physical uh, moment of region? The, the, if, you, if you look at the full complex point, do they, do they blow up at some point? And, uh, so, so, the, so when you go to complex. I want to answer that question at the end, can I? Because okay. it's, a, it's actually kind of an interesting story. Yeah. It is a great question, though. Okay. The short answer is the analytic structure is fine, but it's more difficult to work with to do things like recursion relations because the presence of an isolated essential singularity, whenever those, whenever those overlap poles, I think things. normally you're not allowed to put attach an amplitude with e to the minus p square or something like that. It's not the. It's no, 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 no. But this is not. No, 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 no. As you go off to the boundary on the complex plane, right. you get back exactly what you're used to. These are isolated essential singularities, like in the middle of your plane. Okay. What's crucial in those are in the analyticity arguments is the asymptotic. It's the large momentum right. behavior. Right. What's crucial here is that the large momentum behavior is recovering. The usual so row equals zero. 
So you don't, yeah. So if you go back, if you go back to this formula, if you were to go, if you were to go off to infinity, yeah. in the, anywhere in the complex plane, all of these factors go to one. Oh, that's, yeah, that's incredibly important. And it just follows from Lorentz symmetry here. Okay, so we can continue on. We can look at the rank two case. So I'll call this the tensor light current. And now I'm going to reverse the order of analysis because now you know you should look at the current first. And what you find is that if you Taylor expand this, you get a series of total derivatives or order. Okay, so kappa is root G Newton. I'm just, we're going to pretend like it's root G Newton here just so we can make contact with familiar theories. Do an expansion, you get total world line derivatives. The leading order piece is the usual stress energy tensor with kappa appearing, no row dependence, and then just order row. Okay, so you should expect to get leading physical effects that should be GR-like in the limit of row goes to zero. There's no other choice, like there's no other option here. You are, you're also going to get problematic UV behavior, but it's no different than what you get in GR. In fact, it's identical to what you get in GR in the UV. Um, I'll just make an aside. This treatment only works to leading order in kappa, and that's because graviton self-interactions and acceleration-dependent terms are important in order kappa squared. But this graviton is also rho not equal to zero. Yes, graviton. this is a rho not equal to zero graviton. I want to show that. In some sense, this is, this is actually an easier case to handle than the other one, where you have rho equals zero, and you try to couple it to rho not equal to zero matter. It's technically simpler. So one simple observable is you could look at gravitational time delay in of say an interferometer arm in a background gravitational field. So shown here is a, it's sort of natural to consider a polarization two state coming in and you can bounce a massless particle back and forth and you can just compute the time delay and not surprisingly you should be used to this by now. Uh, you obtain the standard GR result. So the, this is the length of the interferometer arm. Omega is the frequency of the, uh, of the incoming gravitational radiation. And then, of course, you obtain corrections to this. And these corrections are small in the limit that rho goes to zero. Now, in this particular problem, there's actually a really simple closed form analytic expression for the deep infrared. Uh, it's just a, it's a Bessel function. So if I take the ratio of the time delay at non-zero rho and I compare it to the time delay at rho equals zero, I literally just get a Bessel function. Um, so that's, that's shown here, ratio of time delay on the y-axis, <clears throat> rho over the frequency of the radiation on the x-axis. So you obtain the, you know, the usual result, the ratio of one in the UV, and then you go to the IR, you get a screening effect. You can, again, we're just, you can pick your favorite observable, calculate, this is a common theme. Okay, before moving on, I wanna come back to these terms that we dropped. Okay, so I think, I think you're convinced that essentially the choice here of the current is dictated by this, this, uh, this choice of either, you know, scalar vector or tensor-like, and then you're going to have correspondence with familiar abelian, the abelian parts of familiar theories there. But what about these terms? So we call these shape terms. They're not all that mysterious, though. They appear in, uh, in familiar theory. So if you just took E and M and you had a charge radius, of a state of, a, of an object that you wanted to describe, it would have a shape term. It would have a term in the current that's proportional to the equation of motion. Okay, those terms do not affect far field radiation, but they absolutely affect the near field. They have an effect off the mass shell. Okay, so what do I mean by this? I mean, I mean that if you sit down and you calculate the static potential between two matter particles mediated by a CSP, this term will matter. Now, for every single possibility that you could write down, you always get one over R for the potential. I mean, there's some coupling coefficients that matter, but you always get a one over R behavior in the limit that, the, that your distance scale is short compared to row inverse, right? So that's the correspondence. Now, some of these currents actually don't give you any static corrections. They just give you velocity dependent corrections, but others do give you static corrections. The problem that we have right now is that when rho is non-zero, it's frankly not obvious what the sort of minimal current should be, okay? There's, there are the number of shape terms you can write down that take this form where it's not, it's not clear. Like, should I set those to zero? Like, is the minimal current just set, make this vanish? It's not obvious, okay? So we need additional constraints 
either from a field theory construction or from amplitude arguments, especially amplitudes at complex momentum and demanding general, generalized unitarity. That turns out to constrain, I mean, that should constrain these shape terms. But without that, the best we can say is you have to actually just pick one of these. And then you can go ahead, you can go ahead and calculate whatever you want, but the off-shell part of whatever you're looking at is going to be sensitive to this and it's kind of model dependent. I don't, I think that's an artifact right now. Okay, I think there are completions that should nail this down. Okay, so that's the bird's eye view of what a CSP is, how it can interact, and what you should expect those interactions to look like, at least in the simple theories that we've been able to tackle. So now I'm gonna allow myself to speculate a bit about how these could be related to things we know about. So this is an obvious question. Um, it's particularly obvious because the standard model itself is in some sense a theory of massless particles or a, and, an, and an unnaturally light one as well, okay? Um, and it's after symmetry breaking that things acquire dynamical mass and are in a phase that's, 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 that's distinctive from the phase I've been talking about so far. Now, what we've got right now only lets us touch on the abelian parts, okay? This is annoying. Um, I don't think this is going to last. I think we'll eventually punch through this. The uh, responsible next steps, though, are to actually address self-interactions and non-abelian generalizations. That's work underway. But even before getting to that, at a first glance, you can see there's a number of ways in which CSP physics might touch on beyond the standard model, phenomenology, and existing puzzles of the standard model. And by this, I mean I'm talking about can known particles just have a non-zero spin scale? What would that do? I mean, there's other possibilities, like brand new particles with non-zero spin scales, sure. But I, I'm, I want to talk about the like really conservative option, known particles, non-zero spin scale. So there's three categories I want to flag. So one are the kinds of signatures that this would naturally give rise to in the early universe, just at a totally bird's eye view level. We, we'll touch on thermodynamics. Um, any of these theories are naturally going to come with dark matter candidates, dark radiation and dark matter candidates. And then I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to this, but there's this really cute um, sort of difference in the way that the radiative structure of these theories work. It's quite distinctive. I don't know if this is going to directly connect to the hierarchy problem, but uh, I'll let you decide. So just to remind you, you want to have the dark sector picture in mind. A CSP interacting with matter looks like what you're used to, plus additional states that are weakly coupled. All right. That picture should almost immediately tell you what the resolution to these thermodynamic questions is, okay? Which is, in the early universe, you would expect that you should quickly, I mean, whatever is generating reheating, you would naively expect it to reheat to some thermal bath temperature T matter states. And in this case, I'm just going to imagine that the photon has non-zero rho. And because the principal modes, the H equals plus minus one modes interact without rho suppression, those will equilibrate quickly. But the time scale for equilibrating the other modes is parametrically suppressed, well, it's longer by a factor of temperature over spin scale to various powers. So you can compute this precisely in our, in our, uh, in the exist, using the existing formalism we have. By precise, I mean scalar QED. So you have to ignore, you know, the spin of the, you know, of the electron, for example. And what ends up happening is the partner. So shown here is uh, energy over temperature, and this is phase space density, loosely speaking. You quickly get the normal maximal, you know, the normal distribution for the principal modes. Sorry about the color change here. And then the partner modes fill in from the infrared. They're dominantly populated in the deep infrared. What you find is that for a spin scale, the photon less than about a millielectron volt, um, you don't effectively thermalize any of the additional modes. So you don't have any N effective constraints. This is a loose estimate at this point. A more precise calculation should be done. And in fact, you can track this even further and you find that the growth of the number density of states grows at most logarithmically. It's a very slow growth of states. So even at a, at a practical level, even in like laboratory settings where you try to create a thermodynamic bath and then look for like anomalous cooling, it's incredibly hard at the temperatures that we're used to working with to look for departures from, from just normal thermodynamic equilibrium 
for values of the spin scale less than about a milli electron volt. Why is it logarithmic suppressed? So, so loosely speaking. So by log, what I mean, what I mean here is that the uh, I want to see if I can give a one sentence answer, so I can just give you the derivation. Can we come back to this because yeah, sure. I don't think I have a one a one liner. Perfect. So if you saturate the uh, electron volt scale estimated bound from say n effective of the CMB, I just I just want to keep reminding you this is the photon at non-zero row, right? Um, what you should expect is you, the infrared in that case, if you ask about it in terms of frequency on the sky now, would correspond to the sub 100 megahertz range. Okay, So that's the very low end of the, of the frequency range that's been measured in the CMB. It has been measured down there. Um, I mean, I, th I think this is a recent plot going down to this, uh, to this 100 megahertz uh, uh, range shown. But you can, in principle, start to see departures from what you would normally expect for a black body spectrum down in that range. So it might be interesting to look there. So a full calculation of, of, those, of those corrections has not been done yet, but that would be an interesting place to look. The other natural possibility is to consider trying to detect the partner modes of the CMB directly, because you're also going to populate a small, a small amount of power is going to go at any finite row, a small amount of power is going to dominantly go into the nearest neighbor modes, which in, which in this case is polarization zero and plus minus two. It's an open question what the best way to detect that is. I, I mean, my hunch is that the same kinds of cavity technology is used to look for, say, ultra low mass dark matter in a perhaps modified setup could be useful for this kind of thing. Uh, but that in practice might be even more effective than trying to go to the very low frequency range of the uh, of the uh, of the CMB in the principal polarizations. Okay, changing gears here because again, I want to. This is bird's eye view, just giving you a sample. Now, the standard model is in a massive phase, so you should ask. Can CSPs get into a massive phase? Now, this is ongoing work, but in the abelian case, there is fortunately a relatively straightforward path for analyzing this. Um, at any fixed rank it's sort of known how to add a mass term in a healthy way. Um, the precise map, like the story is still, is sort of still being developed here. Um, there's a particular onsatz for a mass term that you would add that's sort of the analog of a Stuckelberg mass. Uh, there are some subtleties that kick in at rank three, but never mind that. What you would expect to happen if you, if you do this in the abelian model is that this results in an, a CSP going into now a massive tower of modes. I mean, it's exactly what you would guess, right? So you, you still couple to a conserved current, but now the spectrum gets lifted. And now you have, you know, all your modes are massive, but you still have this hierarchical dark sector like structure. Now that's of course not, you know, this is not realistic for, for standard model model building. What you ideally want is to know how this works in you know, non-abelian electroweak theory. But if, and now I'm going to speculate even a bit more, if this naive scaling that you get from the abelian models holds, and I think there's good reasons to think that that parametric scaling would hold, uh, then you get towers of partner modes, now massive modes of the W and Z bosons, and you would also get them of matter states in the standard model if, you, if matter had non-zero row. And generically, these modes are unstable, right? They can decay to standard model states, they have some pretty unusual interactions given their polarization content, right? These are partners of the W and Z that are either scalar or spin two. And then there's likewise spin three partners and so on. Um, some of you, of course, are very familiar with this kind of thing in, ex in models with extra dimensions. So this is not totally unheard of. Um, and the mechanism, but if you go far enough away from the principal mode, uh, these states become cosmologically long-lived because their couplings are, are very, very tiny. And if you do a sort of naive estimate of the spin scales at which you obtain cosmologically long-lived states that you could populate through essentially freeze-in, you get these scales for the W and Z, and you get this scale for 
partners of low-lying matter states in the standard model. So if this parametric hold, if these parametrics hold, you naturally get dark matter candidates. Right? And if they're not dark matter, they're partner modes that can be in principle cosmologically long-lived. So sorry, is this an example of a spin three half particle that you could freeze in without having to specify a reheat temperature? Like, is it IR dominated? Well, so if by IR dominated, you mean, you know, boundary, I think it's got the usual, you have to ask like what's happening at the end of inflation in any freeze-in model. But if you make if you make the assumption that you're not getting some contribution at the end of inflation, like through direct couplings to the inflaton or whatever, then it's not IR, then, then it's just determined by basically pick a row. If you, so in the, in the deep UV, all of these states decouple. And so everything is dominated by the infrared, okay? We know the infrared evolution pretty well. And so you have it, you, you're going to get a sharp prediction for the density as a function of rho. You still got to make that assumption that the boundary conditions don't matter. That's the usual thing. Okay. So once you fix rho, you've got your density, you've got all your couplings worked out. I mean, the, there's no wiggle room in these, in these models. I don't even want to call them models because we don't have the non abelian generalizations. These are scaling arguments. Okay. I'm, I'm doing this to just motivate the range of a range of scales. Like if you're asking, like, what would be an interesting range of scales from the standpoint of standard model phenomenology and beyond the standard model physics? It's this sort of, it's this range highlighted here. And the parametric scaling arguments are what I showed on the previous slide. And the reason I want to flag this is that that range, you can look at another source of, uh, of constraints and production on low mass particles, namely the sun, right? The sun can produce anything that's in this low mass range that couples to normal matter. Uh, this range overlaps the sort of naive estimate of stellar cooling bounds. Uh, but even when you are at the stellar cooling bounds and below, you can do sort of simple estimates for the flux of partner modes that would impinge on, say, helioscopes. And the power going into helioscopes could, in principle, be signif significant enough to be detected. Again, these are estimates for like the numbers of X-ray modes that would be produced by the partner modes produced in the sun impinging on, uh, on a sort of typical helioscope in operation today. Okay, so these are, these are totally naive estimate rates. The formalism that we've developed in principle can allow for a calculation of incoming radiation exciting the modes in these cavities. I mean, that's the actual calculation you have to do carefully, all right? The subtlety there is understanding how the shields in those problems actually interact with that radiation because it's slightly different. But in principle, that calculation can be done. These estimates are just done at the sort of particle scattering level. Okay. Uh, just to wrap up, I will just sort of tell you, because this just tickles me to no end. Um, so I want to go back to the tensor components, because there's something peculiar that happens in these theories, in the abelian theories. So if you look at the expansion of Lagrangian, you have something like a scalar that couples to a, to a you know, it's, it's built out of world line variables here, but it's like some, it's like a scalar operator. And if you would just use this piece, this is the piece that's always giving you the one over R potential. Okay. But the theory is invariant under a set, it has a gauge redundancy that is not a shift symmetry. It's, but it almost looks like a shift symmetry. It, it shifts into something like the scalar shifts into something proportional to rho times a gauge parameter that has to vanish at infinity, which is why it's not a shift symmetry. But it is enough to forbid mass terms. Nonetheless, you know, you get this one over, now what we're used to are theories that have a shift symmetry that can do that, but then you don't ever get a one over R potential. Like that's just totally at odds with having a shift symmetry. You don't get a long range one over R potential. How that happens here is these partner mode contributions play a crucial role. So you can retain the sort of gauge redundancy of the theory from the contributions of the partner modes. So that's how you retain, that's how you sort of don't spoil the, uh, the, the gauge symmetry of the theory and remain compatible with, with one over R. So this, is, this was my way of sort of framing the classical puzzle, the classical field theory puzzle. If you sit down and you start calculating loops with the path integral, so this is now, con, you know, this is, the, this is the hierarchy problem that we're used to. Normally, if you, take a, if you take a scalar polarization state, like you just take a scalar on these lines and you couple it to a heavy scalar and you compute these loops, you get logarithmically divergent contributions that are proportional to the mass of the heavy scalar. And the problem with that is that even after you, in the absence of fine tuning, 
that generally spoils the presence of a, of a low mass pole. Like if you tried to start out with a pole in perturbation theory at zero mass, these terms when resummed would drag your pole mass away. Right, that's one way of framing the hierarchy problem. When we compute this at any finite row, as you take the limit P squared goes to zero for the scalar polarization mode, these contributions vanish. Now what's happening here is that at some point, as you take P squared to zero, you eventually go below the spin scale. And that's where you start to see a departure from, from so instead of getting something proportional to the mass times a log, you, you, end up, you end up getting a screening in the infrared now. By infrared, I mean take P squared goes to zero. It ends up protecting this pole at zero. That is not like anything I am aware of in other models that you know, try to like stabilize these hierarchies by canceling off quadratic divergences. Now, I don't know. Now, I will just say that the, the analytic structure as you approach zero, so if you're in a neighborhood of zero but not at zero, that actually depends on these shape terms that we haven't nailed down. Okay, so this is like, I really wanna nail the minimal current down. I wanna sort of see how this works. So this is work underway. I don't know if this mechanism is like intimately tied to it being a CSP at a mechanical level, like the, analytically though, this is quite distinctive, like just the mechanics of how this works is, is unlike anything else I've ever seen. Is the correction finite? That's a correction two, two point punch. It's not, no, I mean, it's got the same, it has the same kind of logarithmic divergence you're used to. I mean, you would, like, even if, in, even in QED, if you compute this two-point function mm -hmm. for polarization, one external state, so you get a logarithmically divergent correction. Mm -hmm. But you don't spoil the presence of the pole mass at zero because the entire contribution is proportional to P squared, and it vanishes in that limit, okay? Uh, so the correction to the two-point function in the limit where a moment that goes to zero is... That vanishes. In the limit that p squared goes to zero, that contribution, this contribution vanishes. Uh, and uh, that crucially relies on non-zero row. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am over time, so I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna go back to this slide. This is the high level takeaway again. Fundamental question, is the spin scale of known familiar particles vanishing or not? The non-zero option, um, there's I think a mounting body of evidence that this could be a lot more interesting than anybody had any right to expect. Um, I still think there's plenty of room for theoretical inconsistencies to derail this, in particular in the self-interaction story. I think those doubts will always be there until somebody just builds the counterexamples, <laughs> constructs the theory. Um, and I, if viable, uh, I think this really raises a lot of questions about how we should think about the standard model. The picture I have in my mind is that it's not just an effective theory with some UV cutoff. We should be on the lookout for interesting departures in the infrared as well. So I'll leave it at that. I have a ton of backup slides, but I'm going to stop there. All right. Questions? Yeah. So thanks for the nice talk. Um, so we touched on this earlier, but I'm still curious about this case of uh, regular old rho equals zero GR couple of the CSPs, because you've written down this action that's manifestly Lorentz invariant. So now instead of demanding that everything just transforms under the Lorentz group, now you just say it's diffeomorphism invariant and like what goes wrong? So there's case? no problem making that theory, that action I wrote down, diffeomorphism invariant. That is straightforward. The problem is that when you make a diffeomorphism invariant, you end up with a, uh, you end up breaking the CSP gauge symmetry. If you just do the naive thing, like the vanilla thing, like take all your take all your metric contractions, contract them with a dynamical metric, et cetera, that no, that if you just do that thing, it spoils the gauge redundancy of the CSP. That's the, the that is the sort of zeroth order thing you have to fix. Now there's there's analogs of this in higher spin theory, and in particular there's an analog of this I believe in the case of like if you want to couple like a spin three halves particle. And there the resolution is, is, is Susie. It's local Susie that resolves the problem there. So I don't know if there's gonna be a resolution to that obstruction that works like that, okay? To me, what, it, what feels most natural is that any theory that has non-zero row in the spectrum, it won't surprise me if at the end of the day, 
gravity itself has to have non-zero rho. And it wouldn't shock me if the spin scales have to be related to all the, like all of the spin scales in, of all of the degrees of freedom have to be tied to one another. That wouldn't shock me either. And part of the intuition for that is that this way of framing the theory is that the, the spin scales is sort of tied to the structure of this auxiliary space. And so if you want to like really go down this, this road of thinking of that auxiliary space as becoming dynamical, you might think that rho is a property of that space. I mean, it has units of, of inverse length. I mean, it's a scale. And as soon as you do that, it, to me, it seems like it would be unnatural for if, if, if one person, if one degree of freedom is going to have non-zero row, it seems like all of them would have to have the same row. This is, this is purely speculative, but that's, that is like the, that's the sort of picture that I suspect is most likely to be correct at the end of the day. So in that spirit, though, I mean, it, since the milli EV scale has showed up a few times, surely you've thought about the CC. Yeah. So uh, is there uh, some fun speculation if you try to connect those numbers? I can, I, you know, you, I'm happy to, I'm happy to speculate offline, but I can, I'll, I'll take you to one. But I want you to do it on the recording. I will, I will. <laughs> So it's not milli EV. Yeah, it's not milli EV that's the interesting scale there. It's it's a much, much, much smaller spin scale for gravity. Okay. So so think think about like something something more like Hubble scale. Okay. I mean, we normally we set this parameter to zero, so so who cares if it's really, really tall, really small. But to, to really know, don't you need a full series? Absolutely. That's no. why that's why this is deep in backups. <laughs> no, I mean I I, I want to be really clear that that we have to nail down the minimal current before we know beyond any doubt what the deep infrared part of the current looks like. All we can do right now is say, well, okay, fine, let's make a guess. For a given guess, what happens? Is it interesting or is it not interesting? And all I want to do is tell you that there are plenty of guesses where it's really interesting. And one such, and you know, so there's 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 a whole family of, of onsatses for the minimal current, where as you go into the deep infrared, I mentioned there was this screening effect. So the actual potential has an inflection, one inf like a first inflection point, where there's a scale at which there's a scale at which you go from attractive to repulsive. Okay. And then it'll actually reverse again. It's getting weaker and weaker as you go as as the distance scales increase. Yeah. So that's what's that's what's shown here. Now, the way to think about this, it's actually kind of intuitive. The primary mode is what's controlling the short distance attractiveness. The partner mode, which has spin one in this case, is giving you a repulsive effect that's kicking in because everything has the same charge in the case of GR. So there's a, there's a repulsive term that's kicking in and that's strongest at the scale of order row inverse. And then that gets washed out by its partner modes as everything falls off. So I don't want to get carried away with this, but it's, you know, this is why this needs to be resolved. This minimal current question. The CPT serum works for you. Yeah, there's no issue. I mean, at the at the at the at the well, you could mean several things by that. Like in these that's toy that's models, that's there's that's no that's issue. That's hydrogen that's way the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm asking. <laughs> All of these questions are yeah. No CPT is fine. CPT is fine. Basically, anything, any yeah, it's fine. <laughs> So then, uh, let's see. I mean, I, I, I could, I have more I could say about, about gravity, but let's see if there's other questions. Yes, I, I might have just seen part of it in your, uh, as you were flipping through there. Uh, I want to say thank you. This was very, very interesting. Um, the, the question was, yeah, exactly. Should I expect that there is some extended spinner helicity formalism uh, where you can just write down the on shell amplitudes? Yeah, and so this is fun. Um, we should probably talk about this offline, but the short answer is that right now we are looking at it in two comma two signature. Ooh. Because in two comma two signature, you can work with uh, real spinners and keep everything on shell. And that turns out to be technically simpler for building CSP-like representations at the three particle level. And then you can glue those together with recursively and then analytically continue back to three comma one to get something like a, it's a little bit more involved than that, but. Yeah, we like two comma two signature here. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's also worth I'd say. I mean, I, I think Tom's uh, point earlier was well was on point. Um, it, it does smell similarly to the non commutative field theory amplitudes. Uh, Nathaniel and I uh, tried to understand some some things about um, the analytic structure there and related to the hierarchy problem. Uh, it would be interesting to see how how that relates to the analytic. Uh, the structure. conclusion was. So, 
What was the conclusion? Um, the conclusion okay. is that it, well, the conclusion is that there's very interesting things in non-commutative field theory, but but it's too Lorentz. It's it's very Lorentz non-invariant, and so it's not going to be actually the theory of the real world. But here, if you can find similar interesting analytic structure in the Lorentz invariant way, it's probably the same. Just this mathematical fact that that like finite like this this tower of poles that represents an isolated essential singularity actually could be far better behaved than any finite order pole, mm -hmm. and you can actually get. Like you're fine. Like you could do a simple anal like a Taylor expansion and, and fool yourself into thinking that something's poorly behaved in the UV when in fact it's it's actually it's actually falling. Yeah, it's closely related. I mean the weird analytic structure in the non-commuter field theory case, I remember correctly, it is off at infinity in the complex plane. Yeah. It's, okay. it, it, yeah. So maybe it's a little a little different. it is different here. Yeah, but 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 it would be very interesting if there there's some Yeah, no, the, the UV is just not is not different here. It's okay. uh, that's that's a very interesting feature. And here's your yeah. Here's the spinner helicity slide. Oh. You can. This is how you set things up in spinner helicity. It's a different talk. Cool. Okay. I'll look forward to that one another time. Uh, please thank Philip again. Those who want to ask questions, if you allow. People want to continue questions. That's also okay. But those who want to leave. <laughs> so, what's your schedule? Are you are you, are you around tomorrow? Or? So I am here today, and then I'm going to go to Fermilab. Must be sensitive.